We're going to get into what God has to say to us this morning. Turn to the book of Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And uh, we will eventually get to verses 47 and 48. And you'll see them obviously here on the screen. And we'll get to that in a minute. We're in a series of messages. It's the second message of it that I've entitled... Days of Destiny, four days of destiny. We're looking at four different days in Jesus' last week on earth and what they mean, both for Him and for the purpose of God, but also what they mean to us this morning. And today we're going to be looking at the very tragic and yet very instructive story of Jesus or the betrayal of Jesus, of Judas' betrayal of Jesus and what we can learn from that. Now, all of us have been betrayed in our lives. I mean, if you live life at all, you understand that. That, uh, that people sometimes will stab you in the back, or sometimes they'll, they'll uh, violate your trust in them. Maybe it's a person that you thought was a friend, or perhaps someone you were counting on, and then they ended up letting you down. We've all been betrayed. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's unintentional. When I worked at Corning, uh, once in a while I would be put on a job that they called reinspect, and it's exactly what it sounds like. You reinspected where? There would be skids of where that got rejected because they had too many rim checks or unfill or whatever, and you would go piece by piece through that skid, throw out the bad, keep the good, and get it shipped out. And sometimes they would even schedule reinspect crews, the crew four or five, who that's what you did that week. Is you just sat there. Every day, looking at where. It was a very boring job. And so when you put on a reinspect crew, you did your best to try and, you know, make the week go by as quick as you could. So you'd laugh and joke and things like that. And uh, so I was on this reinspect crew, and I thought things were going great. It was about Thursday of the week, and I thought we were all getting along fabulously and uh, <coughs> get through this week. About 3 o'clock on Thursday, the foreman comes back to where we're at, and he says, uh, Chris, uh, I need to talk to you right now in my office. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I don't know what this is about. So I put down my wear and I get up and I go to his office. Of course, everybody's looking at each other, a little excitement in an otherwise boring day. And they're, just, you know, what's this about? So I go to the office, sit down, and the foreman said, now, Chris, uh, um, I just need to let you know we've been getting some complaints about you. I'm like, over what? <laughs> Well, we've heard that uh, you're not keeping pace with everyone else there in reinspect. They're looking at so much wear, you're only looking at this much wear. And when you go on break, you're coming back late from break. And we've heard you're taking a lot of restroom breaks or whatever in between your normal breaks. And you just need to watch yourself. I said, who said this? Of course, I can't tell you who said it. You know, that's someone said syndrome. I can't tell you who it was. So I knew it was just one person, because he made it singular. I can't tell you who it was. I said, well, I don't know what they're talking about. Have you seen me do this? And the foreman said, no, I haven't seen it. I, I'm just, you're not in trouble. I'm not writing you up. I'm just telling you to kind of watch yourself. I said, well, I'll watch myself doing the same thing I've been doing, because I haven't done anything wrong. But uh, I appreciate it. He could tell I was upset. You know, you, of course you get upset when someone accuses you of something you're not even guilty of. And so I, I walk out and, you know, you feel like the knife's in your back. You feel betrayed. And, of course, you look at everyone around you and the first thought is, who is it? <laughs> okay, well, I thought you looked at me funny. You know, you do that sort of thing. And of course, they asked me what had happened and I told them and all of them were like, act all surprised. So I don't know who it was that uh, said that. But that's just an example. You know, we've all been there been betrayed. Some betrayals are like that. They amount a whole lot in the course of a life. Other betrayals cut deep and, and leave scars really that can last your entire life. Well, the greatest betrayal of all, of all time, is that betrayal of Judas to Jesus. And that's what we're going to look at today. I mean, it just boggles your mind when you stop and think about it. Here is Judas one of the 12 disciples handpicked by Jesus himself. It's 
spent three years in intimate contact with Christ, seeing what he saw and doing what he did and experiencing what he experienced, hearing what he heard. And yet, this one who is closest to Jesus, one of the twelve closest, turns on him and betrays Christ into his enemy. And it's easy for us here, 2,000 years to remove, to look at the story of Judas and start wagging our finger at him and shaking our head and going, tisk, tisk, tisk. How could that happen? Judas is such a bad person. I'd never do that sort of thing. But before we get too quick in doing that, we need to ask ourselves this question. What would it take for you, for me, as followers of Jesus Christ to turn on him. To betray the Christ we love this morning. You see, the story of Judas isn't given in Scripture just so we can pump up our own ego and think we'd never do that and feel better about ourselves. It's given for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is it serves as a warning to every follower of Jesus. And so that's what we're going to look at. Because to understand the danger, we really need to understand the story of Judas. Where he came from. Why he was following Jesus. What this whole thing was about. And the scripture I gave you is the moment, point in time of his betrayal. But we need to understand what's going on before that. And, in, and so I'm just going to tell you the story. It's found in the four gospels as well as a little bit in the book of Acts. And uh, each gospel writer tells the story generally the same, but they each give a little different detail. So instead of turning to a bunch of different scriptures, I'll just kind of tell the story leading up to the scripture that we'll read this morning. And the story of, G of Judas really begins with his name. His name was Judas, but he's called Judas Iscariot. Now, Iscariot was not Judas' last name. They didn't have last names back then like we do. But it was descriptive of where he came from, much like Saul of Tarsus describes where he came from, Tarsus. Well, Iscariot describes where Judas came from. The word means man of Kerioth. And uh, so Judas came from a, the village of Kerioth. Matter of fact, he's the only disciple to come from Judah uh, versus from Galilee. And uh, it could also be translated dagger man. Which leaves many commentators, it's not a universal accepted theory, but many commentators feel that Judas was part of a group of Jewish people who were zealots. Zealots who wanted to overthrow Rome by revolt. Remember, the Jewish people are under Roman rule. And none of the Jews liked it. They all wanted to get out of the shackles shackles of Rome, but there was a certain segment that wanted to do it by force. They wanted to take up arms against Rome and lead a revolution against them and set themselves free. And uh, many commentators feel that Judas was part of that faction that wanted to do that. And so that's kind of his background. That's his mindset. That's where he's at. And so along comes Jesus, and he calls Judas to be his disciple. And I can imagine, of course you're kind of reading between the lines here, but I can imagine that Judas starts following Jesus with the idea in mind that Christ is the Messiah. Prophesied, we've been waiting for, and now he is going to rise up as the rightful king of Israel, lead this revolt against Rome, and I will be a part of it, and then afterwards I will have a position of authority and, and uh, prestige in this new kingdom. That's what was going through his mind. So he begins to follow Jesus. And like I said, these aren't fringe followers. This, this, these are people, these 12, they were handpicked by Jesus himself. They were the ones that, that, that slept in the same house as that Jesus slept in. They heard teaching, intimate teaching, that's not even recorded in Scripture. They spent 24-7 with Jesus for three years. And, and Judas, think about what he saw with his own eyes. 
He, was, he saw water turn to wine. He saw lame people being healed right in front of his eyes. Legs that were gnarled and disfigured and weakened from misuse suddenly straighten and grow strong as, as men would leap up who before couldn't even walk. He saw that. He saw blinded eyes that, that was obvious they were clouded over with no sight at all become clear as men could see. He even saw people that were cold and dead raised to life again. All that Jesus. He was in the boat, you remember. When they, the disciples thought they were going to drown, and they woke Jesus up. And Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, peace be still, and immediately, I mean immediately, the storm ceased. And Judas was one of the ones who said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and waves obey him? I mean, he, he was privy to all this stuff. Judas heard the teaching and instruction of Jesus, not just what we have publicly and written in Scripture, but as I mentioned, the, the intimate teaching, the times alone with Jesus. He saw so much. He even participated in the ministry of Jesus. Think about it. He was one of the disciples that went out and was able to cast demons out in Jesus' name. All this was being poured into him. Jesus Christ poured his very soul and life into these 12 men during the three years they walked with him. And yet in spite of all of this, in spite of it all, something was amiss in Judas's heart. Something wasn't right. Something remained unsubmitted. And in the end, he turned on Christ. And the question is, why? How could someone who spent three years with Jesus betray him? What is going on here? Well, we can see that as Judas as a zealot, he was looking for Jesus, for the Messiah, to politically overthrow Rome. And more than likely, that's probably why he originally began to follow Jesus. But here's what happened. As time went on, as he began to overthrow, <laughs> Live with Jesus, follow Jesus, go where Jesus, see what you, it became evident. Jesus had no interest <coughs> in leading a political revolt. It became evident that that is not where Jesus' mindset was. I mean, there were even times when Jesus, when the, when the crowd wanted to crown him king and Jesus refused. After feeding the 5,000, they were ready. To make him king, I can imagine Judas saying, okay, this is it. we got these people behind us. They'll make you king. We'll get this ball rolling now. And Jesus didn't, he refused. He wouldn't let them claim him as king. And then especially the last year of Jesus' life on earth, Jesus began doing really weird things. <laughs> he began to really press about how if you're going to really follow me, you're going to have to pick up your cross daily and follow me. What kind of talk is that? Talk about death, losing your life for my name's sake. He even talked about how you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood uh, to have a part of me. And all this hard talk about what it means to... And he was turning people away. And all the while, the opposition from the religious leaders continued to grow and... It did not look good at all as far as Jesus leading a revolt. And then Jesus would talk about being crucified and handed over to his enemies. And what's that about? That's not what I had in mind when I began following him. But then, Jesus enters into Jerusalem that last time. It turned out to be the last time, the triumphal entry. We talked about it last week. I mean, just put yourself in, in the mindset of Judas. Things have been going bad for Jesus in his mind. Popularity down, opposition rising. But then he raises Lazarus from the dead. And all of, that, all of a sudden, that piques the interest in Jesus again. Everyone's all excited about him again. And then the triumphal entry, and he's coming into Jerusalem. And there's not 5,000 like after he fed the people. There's tens of thousands of people lined up crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this time, instead of Jesus rejecting 
their worship and saying it's not time. This time, he gets on a colt and he rides in fulfilling Zechariah 9 9. Everyone knows it. He is presenting himself as the Messiah, as the king. And I can imagine Judas is walking along thinking, oh, finally. Okay, we went through a rough pasture. I didn't know quite what was happening. But now Jesus himself is embracing this mantle as king. And we'll get this revolt started. And the ball go rolling in the right direction now. But then what happens? Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he doesn't organize a revolt. What's the first thing he does? Is he goes to the temple and he makes everybody mad again. He cleans the temple out from all the money changers and the selling of the goats and sheep and all of that. And he, he runs them all out and he upsets all those people. He upsets all the people trying to buy the stuff. He upsets the religious rulers. And then he spends the week arguing with them and making them more and more and more mad. He's not, he's not following the script here. What's going on? And then finally, the last straw. Jesus is in the house of Simon the leper, and a woman comes with an alabaster box full of perfume, very expensive perfume. She breaks it open and pours it upon Jesus. And, of course, Judas, heading up the rest of the disciples, they're all muttering this could have been sold, the money given to the poor. Although Judas really didn't care about that. He just wanted the money because he was stealing from the treasury. That's what one of the gospel writers tells us. But they're muttering away, and Jesus calls them out and says, What are you complaining about? This woman has done a beautiful thing. She is preparing me for my burial. Burial? What kind of Messiah, what kind of deliverer gets killed and buried? Who am I following here? I can just imagine what is going through Judas's mind. And that seemed to be the last straw. Talking about being killed and buried. This is not what I signed up for. We can't talk any sense into this, Jesus. And so Satan, seizing the opportunity, the Word of God says, enters into Judas. And he inspires Judas to go to the enemies of Christ and offer to betray Jesus, betray him for 30 pieces of of silver, the price of a slave. And then he just waits for the opportunity because they don't want to do it with a crowd around. He doesn't have to wait long. As the week progresses, Jesus then has what we call the Last Supper with his disciples. And think about it. Even then, Jesus is reaching out in grace and love to Judas. He washes Judas's feet. Think about that. Knowing that this man has already arranged to betray him, he washes his feet. And then he allows Judas to sit close to him during the Last Supper, and he even gives Jesus, or Judas, a piece of bread dipped. He hands it to Judas, which is a sign of honor and love and grace. But Judas rejects all of that. He leaves the Last Supper. And he goes to Jesus' enemies because I know where he will be later tonight. It's a place where Jesus frequented often when he was in the area. I know exactly where he's going to be. And I'll lead you to him. And when we get to that place, I will show you who he is by kissing him on the cheek. And that's exactly what happened. And that's where we pick up the reading now. In Luke chapter 22, verses 6. 47 and 48. While he, meaning Jesus, was still speaking, because he was uh, talking to his disciples who kept falling asleep. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man? with a kiss. The New Living Translation puts it this way, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And that's the question I ask all of us. Would we betray the Son of Man? And the question is why? 
Why would Judas do this? What would ever compel him to get to this point? That's what we're going to look at here. Why did Judas betray Jesus? I'll tell you in a nutshell why. It's because he never really submitted to God's way instead of his way. That's the bottom line. See, the fact of the matter is, every disciple, matter of fact, the whole nation kind of had this understanding that the Messiah was going to come and free them from Roman rule and set up Israel once again as the kingdom on earth and would rule and reign the world from there. I mean, that's in prophecy. That's what they all kind of expected. Now, Judas took it a step further in that he was willing to grab a dagger and lead in the revolt. But everyone expected the Messiah to do that. But somewhere along the line, as they begin to follow Jesus, they begin to understand that's not quite what was going to happen. Every disciple had to get to that point where they had to put aside their idea and their agenda, what they thought should happen, and begin to embrace what Christ was really there for and who he really was. Not obviously with full understanding, because you can read the gospel and see even up to his his death, even after his death, they really didn't comprehend the full aspect, but they had to get to that point of just letting go of their ideas and saying, this isn't going to happen the way I thought. Jesus isn't going to do what I thought he'd do, and he's not who I really thought he was in that regard. There's a whole different plan in place here, and I don't understand it, but I'm going to keep walking with Jesus. Every disciple had to get to some point of surrender like that. Judas never did. He never gave up on his idea. And truth be told, every single one of us need to reach that same point. Because that's the pattern we all follow. Every one of us who call ourselves a Christian today, who have said yes to Jesus, we came to Jesus not really understanding the cost of discipleship. By that I mean we, we come to Jesus for different reasons. For example, when I was eight years old, you know my testimony, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. I didn't understand that someday he would ask me to pastor, ask me to be in full-time ministry. And it's a wonderful blessing, and I want you to think it's a horrible thing. It's a wonderful blessing because I'm in the middle of God's will, but there is sacrifice involved. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and every one of us that way, we come to Jesus, we don't understand the full effect of what it means to follow him more than likely. There may be exceptions here or there, but most people come to Jesus and they don't really understand what does it mean to follow him. What does it really cost? And uh, sometimes we come to Christ because we were raised in a Christian family and we were exposed to the gospel early, and so at an early age, we just received Jesus, and we go on from there. And nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, I wish every family could say that. That's a fabulous way of coming to Christ. But when you receive Christ as a child, you're not going to understand where that path is going to lead and the things that God will see through, the God, things God will call uh, you to do. You don't understand all that. You just know, I need Jesus in my heart. Some people come to Jesus because they're sick of the direction their life's going and they reach that crisis point where they realize, man, I just, I just need God. <laughs> they don't understand much more than that, but they come to the Christ in a crisis moment like that. And, and God is gracious and merciful, but they're not really thinking long term. What does this mean in terms of the changes God's going to bring in my life and what he's going to call for me to do? They don't understand it in that way. So other people come because of some tragedy that occurs that makes them realize they need God. But, and so we all come to Jesus from these different points, some with more understanding than others. But for every one of us, there comes a point in time where we realize, hey, this following Jesus thing, it's more than just me accepting Christ and feeling good. God wants to make changes in my life. God wants me to stop doing this. God wants to change my attitude here. He wants me to forgive who? He's asking me to do what with my finances? 
He's calling me to do what with my life? And we reach these points where we didn't understand it at the beginning. But as we walk with Jesus, we begin to see what it really means to be his disciples. And if we don't get to a point of surrender, where we just say, God, whatever you want to do, God, wherever you want to lead, God, whatever happens, I'm in. If we don't reach that point, what will happen is we'll be just like Judas. We'll get to a point where we say, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I thought it would be. And uh, this, you're not doing what I think you should do. And uh, I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to refuse to do that. And we betray the Christ that we love. See, every one of us need to reach that point of surrender. There's a song. That uh, very simple song, I'm sure you know, it's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Not to say it's all about your willpower, because it's not. As Ryan so often points out in his message, it's not our willpower, it's not me, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. No, but we have to surrender, and then God's grace gives us the ability to live it out. But we have to have that point of surrender, that point of saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. <coughs> Whatever you say, Lord, wherever you lead, whether I understand, whether I don't understand, no turning back. Whether it's comfortable, whether it's not. No turning back, whether it makes me popular or not. No turning back. Though no one follow me, still I will follow. Though so no one join me, still I will follow. If I'm the only one in my home following Jesus, I'm still going to do. If I'm the only one in my workplace with the testimony of God's grace, I'm going to be that shining light. No turning back. No turning back. We need to reach that place of surrender. Even then, when I go through times of doubt, even when I go through times of not understanding, God, what is happening? I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't know if you know the story behind that song. It's really a powerful story. In the mid-1800s in India, there was a man and family who came to faith in Christ through the efforts of a missionary there. And they shortly thereafter wrote this little song. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. Well, shortly thereafter, they got to live out their song. Back in those days, India was mostly a tribal nation, you know, just a bunch of little tribes here or there. And when his tribal chief, the head of his tribe, heard that he and his family had accepted Christ, they, they were drugged before him. And they were given a choice. He, the tribal chief looked at this man, because in that culture, the man decided for the family, and he told the man, you either renounce Jesus, this Jesus thing, or we will kill your children right in front of your eyes. And you know what his response was? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And he watched his children get slaughtered right in front of his eyes. They then took his wife, same thing. Either you renounce Jesus or we will kill your wife. Though no one join me, still I will follow. And with that, they killed his wife. And finally they turned on him. Renounce Jesus or your life ends. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. And with those words on his lips, his life ended. 
gives a whole different meaning to that song, doesn't it? But in a sense, all of us need to make that same decision. Now, you may probably never have to choose literally between your life or the life of someone you love and your faith in Christ. But who knows how this world will end up? It's just going crazy. But all of us need to get to that point where we say, I have decided to follow. I, I have died to myself. I was watching a movie the other day, and in this movie there were these, I guess you call them freedom fighters, and they were fighting the Soviet army in this movie, and they were so outnumbered and uh, outgunned and uh, Death was almost certain for them, and in the course of the movie, someone asked him, how can you be so brave? How can you go out there and fight just knowing you're so outnumbered and knowing you're probably not going to survive? And someone made this statement. When we joined the cause, we considered ourselves dead already. And I thought, that's biblical. Not in that context but in context of serving Christ. Isn't that what the Bible says? That when we follow Jesus, we are crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. Did not Jesus say, if you're willing to give up your life, then you'll find it. Isn't that what Jesus means when he says, pick up your cross daily and follow me? We consider ourselves already dead. So that the life of Christ can be lived in us. Because Paul goes on to say, I am crucified with Christ, therefore it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. I have decided to follow Jesus, and it's His way. It's His life. It's His purpose. It's His agenda. He is the Lord. He is the center. Not me. Not me. Judas never reached that point of surrender. And so when he got disillusioned and the cost got too high and things weren't working out the way he wanted them to, he betrayed his Christ. What about you and me? If we look at the story of Judas, to his completion, it's a sad, tragic tale. Judas betrayed Jesus. Jesus arrested. And when Judas becomes apparent that Jesus is going to be crucified. <coughs> Judas is filled with remorse. We don't know exactly why. Maybe he didn't think it would go that far. Maybe he thought somehow this would prompt Jesus to do something. Uh, we don't know what exactly was going through his mind, but we do know the Bible says at that point he was filled with remorse, but not repentance. And there's a difference. And he went back and he threw the 30 pieces of silver at the feet of, of uh, the, and the elders, uh, the, the teachers of the law. And he said, I've betrayed innocent blood. Of course, they didn't care. They got what they wanted. And Judas never turned back to God. I mean, theoretically, if he had turned back in true repentance and cried out to God for mercy, there would have been forgiveness. There would have been grace. But he, did, he just turned inward, filled with remorse, threw the 30 pieces of silver down, not knowing what else to do with his sorrow, he hanged himself and entered into eternity without God. What a tragic end to someone who walked with Jesus so closely for three years. What will be the end of your story? As I mentioned, most, if not all of you here, would say, I said yes to Jesus. I mean, that's why you're here this morning. I'm a follower of Jesus. And you came to him at different points and, and for different reasons, and all that's fine, but you're following Jesus. But the question is, where will you be 10 years from now? 20 years from now? 30 years from now? Are you still going to be following him? Have you surrendered and given up your idea and your rulership to make Christ supreme? Or is being a Christian going to be in your wheelhouse as long as, as long as it's convenient, 
as long as it's not too hard, as long as it's fun or it gives me what I think I need, as long as God doesn't require too much of me, it's unsacrificial. Is your following of Jesus this morning a convenience for you or a surrendered commitment? Because if it's not a surrendered commitment, you won't last. Because I guarantee you, there will be things happening you don't understand. God's going to want to poke and pry in all areas of your life. He's not going to leave you alone and let you do what you want. He loves you too much for that. He's going to require things of you that you won't want to give up and you won't want to do. And if you aren't at that place of surrender, it'll be so easy to be like Judas. It's not what I signed up for. Let me walk away. Have you decided to follow Jesus? No turning back. That's the question for us all. Dad, if you come to the piano as we wrap this up, if you would just play that simple little chorus I've been referring to. If you have not fully surrendered, today needs to be the day of your funeral to yourself. Today needs to be the day of your full surrender. Today needs to be the day of you being crucified with Christ. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm, what I'm saying is, have you reached that point where you realize, I need to give everything to Jesus. I need to live out Romans 12, 1, and take that life that God has redeemed and offer it back to Him as a living sacrifice. Hands off. All of belonging to you. Without that decision being made, you will not last. You will not persevere through the hard times. But if you make that decision, here's what God will do. Once again, I'm not preaching self-will, self-reliance, willpower. I'm preaching decision. You make that decision of surrender, then what God does is he takes that surrendered, empty life because you've emptied it of your will and want. You said, Lord, here I am. And he fills it with his Holy Spirit.